Romans 5. Last week we started a short recap run-through of the book of Romans, like, a, like the short-sighted person I am, I thought we could do it in one or two weeks, but uh, we just got through first four chapters and part of Romans 5, so, and doing any kind of a recap like this, it's a great idea if anyone should have any questions about things in the book of Romans. I mean, we're not done with the book of Romans, but we did get through the first 15 chapters. And so it's a great idea as you look at the things we're looking at sliding our way through here uh, in recap. It's a, it's a great idea to ask questions. You will not bother me by asking questions. It isn't that I'll give you, I may not give you the answer, but you won't bother me by asking. I refer all the hard ones to people like uh, Dan Lewis and uh, Clyde Heron, Kevin Smith. You guys can handle little hard questions, can't you? Okay. Romans chapter 5. We spent a lot of time on, and on the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 5 last week because the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 5 is a recap of everything that Christ has done for us. And uh, so we never got past verse 11. But just in case, just in case, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 11 has escaped your memory. <laughs> We're going to start in verse uh, 5, Romans 5, 5. And hope maketh not ashamed. I'll tell you something about hope. It's great. It's great. I mean, you watch the kind of events that went on this, just this past week in the world. I mean, the only good thing that happened all week is the Cubs were 4-2. and two. I mean, that's as good as the Cubs ever get anyway. That's the only good thing that happened all week. Everything else was just negative. But if you pay any attention to that, it would drive you nuts. Don't pay attention to that stuff. Pay attention to the fact that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and was raised again for your justification, and that once you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you've got the greatest hope the world has ever known. And hope maketh not ashamed. And those new coffee cups I bought, one of them says hope and one of them says peace. And I won't want to hear any more complaints. <laughs> There's already been complaints about the pastel colors. I mean, and the, and the little embroidery design around the top. But the good news is that no matter what they look like, they hold the same amount of coffee as the old ones. And they were only a dollar. A dollar. You get a lot of mileage for a dollar. Anyway, why would you bring that up in the middle of Romans 5, Barbara? Oh, okay. Where was I? <laughs> hope maketh not ashamed you know what to be ashamed is ashamed is timidity because of what you are or what you believe it's timidity that's caused by what you are or what you believe that's what shame is well I can tell you what you are you ain't nothing but a low down good for nothing sinner if you believe that you're saved by the grace of God you've got no reason to be ashamed Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved, is a magnificent position to have in, in your mind and, and, and spirit that says, I did that. I trusted Christ. I put my faith in him. He says, hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. You know something? If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, there may be times when you would be too timid to bring it up in a group. There are many people who have no uh, intention whatsoever to stand up in front of a group like this and speak it. But if you know that you confess it in your heart and mind and all it stands between you and saying it out loud is the nerve. I got good news for you. It's the greatest way to stand alone in a crowd. <laughs> And automatically in a crowd, if you, if you testify that you believe that Christ died for your sins and that you have trusted Christ as your Savior, 
and that you belong to him, whatever words you use to get that out, if there's anybody else in the crowd that has also done the same thing, they'll say out loud, I'm with you, or amen, or right on, preach it, sister, or whatever. They're going to agree with you. Hope maketh not ashamed. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. How can you be ashamed? You won't be if you know Christ as your Savior. All right? <clears throat> That's not a requirement. It's just the way it is, the way people are. Hope maketh not ashamed. See, what, what happens is the world keeps us from seeing the hope. The world argues for betterment. And the Bible says the world's going to hell in a bobsled. The world is headed toward destruction. Elements burning with the fervent heat. Having to be remade into the new earth and on and on. What are you going to improve? Not much. Improve your lawn. Improve the way you live. Improve your testimony by practice. And improve the use of the word of God in your mind by study. You can improve that. You won't improve the world. Might as well hang that one up. Now notice verse 6. And we went through these last week. Let me go through these a little more rapidly here from here on. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Because of the whole content, uh, content of that verse, we're not saved by his earthly life. We're saved by his resurrected life. You see, the, the point in verse 10 is, as in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Don't put your own activities on to your salvation. Now, this is the best forerunner I know of, verse 10, to chapter 6. We'll get there in just a second. But chapter 6 is all about you being dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, if you were reading the books that Paul wrote from the time, like from uh, uh, left to right in your Bible, you would go through Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then when you got to Colossians, you would see the verse, you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. It takes that long to see it. But between Romans 5, verse 6, 8, and 10, to Colossians uh, 3, verse 4, that whole distance, there is one long list, liturgy of explanation about being dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Look in Romans 11, I mean Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, that'd be Adam, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. That's a great phrase to remember. Sin is not imputed when there is no law. The reason it's great is not to get you out of some guilt or anyone else out of some guilt, but to understand what the law did. The law could never save you. The law could only save you if you were perfect. The law could only save you if you were perfect. So the point about the law is not what you do with the law. It's about understanding what the law did to you. The law said, Thou shalt... And you failed to. The law said thou shalt not. And you did it anyway. Somewhere in the 613 laws. You'll find that to be true. If you keep the whole law and offend in one point. How much of it is he, are you guilty of? All of it. So he says death passed upon all men. Why? Because all sinned. How did they know? They might not have known. 
didn't stop them from dying. Chapter Romans chapter 2, if you'll remember, gives them a, 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 the, the, the picture of the Lord for them. They're going to be judged on the basis of what they did know. Don't worry about those people who were in the world before, before the law. You find that there was a law given in uh, Genesis chapter 2. Then there was a law given when they came out of the garden. Then there was a law given in Noah's time. Then there was a law given unto Noah after the flood. Then there was a law given through Abraham. Not the law, but laws were given. The law given to Abraham is uh, um, believe God and he'll count it for righteousness. You say, well, that's not a law. Oh, yeah? Don't believe God and see what you get. The whole point is there's always been some kind of a law. Paul calls it the law uh, to Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, Galatians chapter 6 calls it the law of Christ. But it's not about a doing. When it's faith or grace, it's about a believing, not a doing. But nevertheless, there's always been a reason to show death by sin. Can't change that. Now notice if you will down in verse uh, 18, and I apologize for skipping all of this, but when you catch that sin is not imputed and where there is no law, you must understand something. Sin not being imputed didn't stop anybody from dying. All died because all sinned. So along comes then the, the, um, the answer to the sin. The answer to the sin is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, read verse 17. I said 18, I mean 17. For if by one man's offense, that's Adam's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now the phrase justification of life is what carries over into chapter 6. Look at verse 21. Not, not 621, 521. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Anyone who says that, you know, they, take, they either, depends on who, who it is that's arguing with you, but they'll say, they'll either say, you, you uh, once, once, in, once saved, always saved people. Or they'll say, you grace believers, and the rest of that statement is, just believe you can do anything you want to do. You know, I asked one guy one, one night in a, at the end of a Bible class, he brought that up to me, and I said, is that a question or a statement? He said, all right, make it a question. Do you believe you can do anything you want to do? And I say, yeah. And he said, see, that's my point. I said, no, that's not your point. Your point is that you think you do good, therefore you're justified. Can't be justified by doing good. How about if you keep the whole law and offend in one point? On a, I said, listen, let me tell you something. You know why I can do what I want to do? He said, well, I suppose because Christ died for all your sins, right? And I said, absolutely. How many of them is all? And he said, all. I said, okay, then we're not, talk, we're not arguing about what a sin is then, are we? He says, no. I said, but what you want to do is to make, you're going to provide the insurance. Christ might have saved you, but you're going to provide the insurance. He wouldn't answer that. I said, look, if you can't be justified by the keeping of the law, we'd already gone all over Romans 3, 4, 5 in that particular Bible class. I said, if you can't be justified by the keeping of the law, and Christ died for all your sins. And he has now given you the atonement. Which sin that you do because you like to do it? Which sin is going to condemn you? How far can you go? Can you lie and still be saved? Murder and still be saved? Commit adultery and still be saved? How far can you go? I want to know because there's some things I want to do. You said I could, you, you made me say that I could do anything I want to do, so I got these things down here, and in your estimation, what is it that I would cross over the line on? Yeah, guess what he said? The ones you don't ask for forgiveness of. 
He said, there's a day coming when you pile up all those things you haven't asked for forgiveness of them, God's going to kill you. He actually said that. He actually said that standing in the lawn of the church that E.C. Moore preached in. <laughs> I just go, oh, yeah. It's incredible what people think all is and don't think all is. You know why you do the things you want to do? Because you're flesh. You know why you stop doing the things that you've stopped doing and don't do anymore? Because you're flesh. And if you understand, if you understand the magnitude of the sacrifice that Christ made for you, God forbid that you should take the license to sin just because you want to. What a strange thought that is. That you just sin because you want to? Well, you probably do. But it's not how far the Lord would take it. The Lord took it all the way. How far would you take it? Shall we, say, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You know what you're, you're living in when you live in sin? In other words, you've got this sin that you just keep doing. You know what you're living in? Stinking, rotten flesh. Well, you're supposed to be dead and your life is here with Christ and God, right? Look at verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we should be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, crucified with him I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me the faith of the son of God is going to outstrip your flesh keep reading verse 6 knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now I want you to keep two verses in mind right here. And notice in, in the first one is verse 4, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now to go over to chapter 7, verse 6, but now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. If you serve in newness of spirit, it is the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, chapter 8, verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. That's not all. Go back to chapter 6 and look at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed... That henceforth we should not serve sin. Now go over to Colossians chapter 2. Hold on to Romans. Go to Colossians chapter 2. The body of sin. He said, knowing that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Now look at Colossians 2 verse 11. Christ, in whom all, uh, also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Well, here's the deal. You got crucified with Christ. I, right here, I'm going to bring it over to this side a little bit. You got crucified with Christ there. Christ's body went into the grave. His soul goes to hell. And the Spirit goes back to God who gave it. And here you are out here, born sometime in the 20th century. I don't see anybody born in the 21st century. Born sometime in the 20th century, looking back at that spot on the cross where Christ died for you, knowing that he was buried, but that God raised him from the dead, and he ascended up and sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high, and sent the Apostle Paul back a message to tell you that you died too. That you died on that cross. You were buried into his death by a baptism called Spirit Baptism, capital S. 
spirit baptism. And there you lay. Three days and three nights later, Christ raised from the dead. If you have trusted Christ, or you will trust Christ as your Savior, let me tell you something. You were on his mind. You were only not only on his mind on the cross, you were on his mind when he went down there to hell and he left your sins there. How else could you get resurrected? Christ took on the sins of the world. How could he get resurrected if he died lost? He died lost. Didn't die a sinner. He never committed a sin. But he died lost. He had my sins on him. Well, how in the world could he get resurrected if God Almighty didn't wipe away the sins? By the way, he wiped away the sins for everybody. Well, he did wipe away the sins, and Paul tells us about it in great detail. From Romans 6 to Romans 7, how we should understand it. From Romans 6 to Colossians 2, what actually happened. Look at Colossians 2 again. Verse 11. Middle of the verse. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Here's Christ on the cross. Circumcision. Body goes to, he uh, to the grave. Soul goes to hell. Circumcision. How'd that feel to you? You didn't feel it. How did it apply to you? God Almighty imputed it to you. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19 says that God is no longer imputing the world's sins unto them. Therefore, that doesn't make the world saved. That makes the world have the opportunity to trust Christ as their Savior. And like that friend that I was referring to there said, you've got to repent of your sins, or ask for forgiveness of your sins. Well, why? Now listen, folks, if you make a practice of, of uh, asking for forgiveness of your sins, you don't need to quit because I said the question, why? You do whatever you want to do about your sins. That's between you and the Lord. If you uh, uh, view your own self better uh, equipped to handle the world around you because you ask the Lord for forgiveness of your sins, I don't care. It's what do you think saved you that I worry about. Your continual repentance before God is putrid. Why would God want to be reminded of your sins? If, he, if you're saved and you, and you pray, does he hear your prayer? Uh-huh, he does. If you're saved and you pray, he hears your prayer. Why would he want to talk to you about your sins? you think of any reason? He killed his son on your behalf, so the sins would be gone. He don't want to talk to you about your sins. He wants to talk to you about what he said in his word you should do. He's not interested in hearing about your sins. You know, the night that that man said that, great friend from Pensacola was standing there. In fact, we'd had the Bible class in that man's house. <laughs> He's standing there and he says, you know what God does when you do that? Said it to this man. And he looked at him like, you know, like, you know I'm pretty sure you can't give me a good answer, so what is it you're going to say? <laughs> and Ralph says, he goes, yawn, yawn. Yeah. <laughs> God Almighty, I want to hear your sins for crying out loud. You think you're the first one to ever committed it? No. <coughs> it's the breaking of the law. The Lord knew what that was when he wrote the law. That's the good news. You haven't surprised him yet. The even better news is you won't surprise him. So when I feel all distraught about my sins, well then stop them, you sorry rascal. You think the Spirit of God is not able to overcome whatever little sins you're carrying around with you? Or big sins? You see, there was a circumcision took place. It's a separation. <clears throat> sins are no more. They're not there anymore. So what did that mean then? Did that mean that you just Come alive to be filled with your desires of your flesh, etc. No, it means you became alive in Christ. And you hear the word of truth, the gospel, your salvation, you trust Christ as your Savior, and you have a Savior. 
Back in Colossians 2, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. The body of the sins of the flesh would be the embodiment. It would be the whole of it. The sins of the flesh, not sin, sins. The sins of the flesh are not being accounted. God Almighty can't see them anymore. They were sent to hell with his son, whom he raised from the dead. Notice verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, the same spirit baptism of 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Think about the faith of the operation of God. Jesus Christ went to the cross, bore your sins, went to hell, full well believing the Father and the Word was going to raise him from the dead. The faith of the operation of God. We have a little bit of a problem. One time I got uh, scratched by a cat. And about three weeks later I had swollen up lymph nodes in my chin. And he, he could actually examine them in spite of all that fat. And uh, he said, uh, we're going to try some antibiotics, see if we can get rid of that. And I said, okay. And it was, the antibiotics didn't work, didn't go away. And uh, he said, we better get that open and find out what it is. I said, okay. He says, well, you've got to go to the hospital and you've got to go to sleep. So I didn't want to do that, but they, you know, you've got to get them out of there and find out what it is. So he takes out three lymph nodes and sends it off to be examined. Said there wasn't any more. Sewed me back up. I went in there and I trusted them. They stuck a needle in my arm and in a few seconds, I'd have trusted anybody. <laughs> Couldn't have cared less. But the point, when they said count backwards from 100, I didn't even get the word 100 out of my mouth. But the point is, I woke up and the lymph nodes were gone. And when they analyzed it, it was cat scratch fever. Didn't go anywhere, but those three lymph nodes. Well, I had great peace about that. I don't know that I ever worried about it, but I remember getting the news that day about it just being cat, cat scratch fever, and I thought, eh, nothing, big deal. So my friend said to me one day, he says, hey, you ever find out what the lymph node deal was? And I said, yeah, it was cat scratch fever. And he says, oh, golly, Jerry. He says, I've got a friend in Little Rock in a coma right now with cat scratch fever. <laughs> Sorry, cats. All of a sudden, I'm mad about the whole thing. Well, looky here. How about the faith of the operation of God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead? Look at the next verse in Colossians 2. Don't get angry about the loss, uh, about the operation of God taking care of a thing. Get the full picture, verse 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he, God, quickened, which means made alive, together with him, Christ, how did he do that? Having forgiven you all trespasses. Trespassing is going across the line. When you get crossways of God's line, you have sinned. There are sins you can commit today, you understand. Therefore, how many of them are forgiven? Ah. See what Romans 5 and 6 and the new life in Christ as in Romans 7 verse, uh, what was that, 5, 6 or 7, 6. But now we're delivered from the law. See what all that does for you? I'll tell you what it does for you. It brings you to Romans chapter 8. Go back there. Romans 8. So here you are out here. There's a moment when you trusted Christ. I was 22 when I trusted Christ. At home, by myself, in the dark. None of that is a prerequisite. You can trust Christ standing right here in the middle of the floor. You can trust Christ. I would say you could trust Christ here at the front of our, but I'm not going to invite you down there. So, Just kidding. It doesn't make any difference where you are or what you're doing or what's on your mind. It matters whether or not when you decide that you're going to trust Christ, you leave all there is to your salvation in his hands. Ever how you describe that? You know, a lot of preachers use the term, and this is not, ne ne not necessarily an incorrect term, because I, I don't mind hearing people say that. They say, as best as you know how, trust Christ. Well, you see, that's the whole point about that is that you don't know how. You have to give up.
You don't trust yourself anymore. You're not all right anymore. You need the salvation that Christ is offering to you. And you trust him, not yourself. Trust Christ, not yourself. That's what's in verse 2 of Romans 8. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, back to verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who, those who are in Christ Jesus, walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. It does not say if you walk. It says who walk. In Christ Jesus, people walk. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Look at verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You're not saved if you don't have the Spirit of Christ. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12, and thir- or 12 13, and 14, in whom, uh, who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after you believed, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit of promise is the spirit of Christ as, as it, in this passage. So when you put your faith and your trust, your reliance on Christ, depending on Christ for your salvation, the position is that you walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. By the way, walking not after the flesh but after the Spirit is a standing, not a state. From time to time, we walk after the flesh horribly. You know, let a little something go wrong. You know, got to go get this patched up, taken out, cured. And we're working on our flesh as hard as we can go. I believe it's right to do that because after all, you're still alive and you're still a witness for Christ and so therefore work on your flesh whatever you have to. But you must understand, to to work on your flesh is not a spiritual thing, it's a literal material and fleshly event. Get on with it when you have to, but remember that that's not where life is. You know... David described life as being 70 years long and if by reason of strength 80, what if you lived to be 95? It still would not be your hope. A good old friend, literally in every sense, of my family is fixing to turn 100, I think Friday. I can't remember when it is. She is a terrific lady, always has been since I was a tiny little boy, I remember Besides that, she had pretty daughters. But anyway, she's going to turn 100. And she still, by the way, she still mows her lawn by a push rotary mower. Her great-granddaughter wrote about her on uh, Facebook. Um, here's, the, here's the point about what I'm saying to you about it. Pearl has never had to work on her body. I don't reckon she's ever been sick except the whatever pregnancies caused. But she didn't work on her body, and yet she does all the time. But even Pearl knows that a hundred spies can be. She knows she's not going to live forever. I mean, the magic day hadn't arrived yet. She might not make it till Friday. Then again, she might live another 20 years, but she knows that's not the answer. No matter how long you live and how good a shape you are, you've got to know walking after the flesh ain't going to get me nothing but death. Walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of Christ in you, then you can walk after the Spirit. If you never trusted Christ, you can't. If you'd be carnally minded, that's just death. Any difference? Look in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. And you can go down through these next nine verses and you can shout by the time you get to the end of them. 
if you want to just demonstrate your sorry, good for nothing flesh. I'm just kidding. I don't care if you shout. Uh, well, I have to bought that out of the uh, uh, archive, though. We couldn't put that on the archive. Verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son. You know, I really love that phrase. I really do. It's meant a lot to me over the years, just to, from time to time, just to see that phrase. He that spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Jesus said to Peter, Do you not know that I can call twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scripture be fulfilled? Verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Well, there's people who want to. They want to drive you crazy with accusations. Preachers want to get you to rededicate your life to the Lord. You know what? The Lord, the Lord isn't interested in your fleshly life. The Lord is interested in what you do and say about Him in your fleshly life. So, well, I think I need to rededicate. Well, go ahead and do it. You know, I, I can tell you this much. Walking down the aisle and shaking hands with a preacher, telling him you rededicate your life is not going to rededicate your life. That won't do anything for you except give the preacher another pat on the back. But I tell you what, it's been my experience that most people who walk down the aisle and rededicate their lives never have trusted Christ as their Savior. You can examine that yourself about that any way you want to. But notice what he says here in verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? Somebody that would condemn you? You know, uh, I love this story, and I probably don't have time to tell it all, but my um, niece uh, got pregnant, and she and her boyfriend got married. And he was the member of a uh, let's just say a strong sect. And uh, the elders came to visit them. And they thought it was fine that the elders come to visit them. They, they thought the elders were going to ask her to join the church. And the elders said, we've discovered, you know, in the condition in which you got married, and we believe that you should come down to the front of the church and uh, repent of that sin openly before the church. And my niece's husband being the man that he is, stood up, walked to the door, opened it, said, goodbye. Yes! Praise the Lord! He knew better than to walk down there and make some show, let them have some show of the flesh trying to get okay with the church. I don't know what else he knew at the time. I know that because of that stand that he took and then he went into the scripture to find out and he found out about salvation by grace and he never backed up from that. Well, praise the Lord. You don't need to admit anything to anybody. You and the Lord already know what you've done. In fact, if you stood up here and admitted it, you'd make some people cry and some people angry. Yes, sir? A question on verse 34. Okay. Uh, can you explain why Christ needs to make intercession for us if we're already saved? On the count of our prayer, look back in earlier in the passage. Look back at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, and here comes the Lord. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. It has to do with saints there, not uh, trying to get forgiveness of sins or whatever. In verse 34. <laughs> that didn't settle it, did it? Why not? What is on your mind about what that says? I mean, I understand that the Spirit interprets our prayers, right? Uh -huh. We don't know what to say. The Spirit speaks for us. But the he that knoweth the mind of the Spirit is Christ. Right. Verse 34. So how is he intercessing for us in, in the way he interprets our prayers to God? Let me ask you, uh, this just, just for perspective, 
Rome, uh, John chapter 1, is Jesus Christ the Word? Okay. Then the prayer, the intercession is to put the Word of God on our prayer. Christ. Christ maketh the intercession for us. It's Christ's intercession by his word that makes the prayer okay, back in verse 26 and 27. He, he is, it is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, he is not specifically talking about dying for our sins, though it took his dying for our sins, his resurrection, and his sitting down at the right hand of God to make intercession for us. But the intercession is to put the word of God back into our heart as opposed to the flesh. So he is answering our prayers or not answering our prayers. That's how he's intercessing for us. Straight, yeah, it is. It's straightening out the prayer by the word of God, which means you either say, thank you for the peace, or you say, thank you for the peace. let me reword this, <laughs> or something along those nature. Okay? Time's up, Doug. Okay. Let's take a break right there. We'll pick up right there next week, the first hour. Good question.